It's a 750 million turnover public company today. Welcome to the podcast, Oliver Yonchev. Investing will never be the same. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Flight Story. And one of the naiveties of growing a business, you start to lose control at certain times. You start to, you know, make naive decisions that changes your influence. My previous company was a business called Social Chain. One day I'm scrolling down Facebook and I see a TED Talk. So I watched it and I was just really inspired. I was like, this is chaos, it's wonderful, it's ambitious. <laughs> but I, I took the leap, joined a startup, um, and that startup went on to be really successful. What, what made it special? Um. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Today we are on tour. We're in London town. We're also at Canon's headquarters. Today it's me, JV and Bax, and we're joined by a very, very special guest, Oliver Yamchev, who's the CEO of Flight Story. It's also extra special because this is our 25th episode of the series. Thank you to everybody that's helped us so far on the journey. And with all that said, welcome to Tomorrow's Workplace Today. So welcome to the podcast, Oliver Yonchev. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. So uh, do you want to, for listeners, watchers, give a bit of an introduction who you are, what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, one of the co-founders of a company called Flight Story. Um, we're a uh, comms and marketing group. We launched a business in December last year. Uh, previous to that, I spent, uh, I've done about 10 years in marketing in various. My previous company was a business called Social Chain. Um, a bit of an enigma in advertising. That was a company that was a startup seven years ago in Manchester, grew to a global business. It's a 750 million turnover public company today. Um, <laughs> going through that process, you learn a few things. I always say at Social Chain, we were vastly underqualified, not not capable, but um, it was a, a bit of a rocket ship. And you learn a few things along that journey. And that was the inspiration for starting something new with my business partner, uh, Stephen Bartlett, who is now a dragon and I suppose seen as a bit of a TV celebrity personality, but I know him as a sort of friend and a mentor and such. So, And trying to give us the story of how did you, I guess, meet Stephen or what, how did you kind of connect that relationship and get involved in social chain? Yeah, so my career, I was working in a company called Bauer Media. Uh, Bauer Media being a large uh, radio and publishing group. Um, and uh, one day I'm scrolling down Facebook and I see a TED Talk. And um, that TED Talk was basically a premise of how I built a multi-million dollar business knowing nothing about business. <laughs> I was like, me neither. That sounds good. <laughs> I like the idea of multi-million pound something and knowing nothing about business. They felt at odds, so I watched it and I was just really inspired. Um, I, I actually did something I'd never done. I'd done this in a, uh, I'd done a lot of business development historically. So I'd, I'd reached out to people and tried to open doors from a sales standpoint and such, but I never just reached out to someone and just serendipitously said, um, really appreciated that, that was inspiring. And I did, and uh, he said, do you want to meet? Asked me if I want to meet, he said, we're, we're a growing business. Um, we're interested in, in great people. So I went and met him met the team and I was inspired. I was like, this is chaos, it's wonderful, it's ambitious. <laughs> um, but there was, it felt like something special was happening. Uh, so it felt at the time a bit of a cliff edge because I was pretty good at sales and I earned a lot of money. And you know, I was in the, what you would call a bit of a salary trap to start taking risk. I had a good, good lifestyle and you know, felt like I'd, I'd been really supported, I had great mentors around me all that type of stuff. Um, but I, I took the leap, joined a startup, um, and that startup went on to be really successful. Mm. So how, how big were they? Leap, that. It was a big leap. <laughs> how big were they when you joined them then? So when I joined them, they were probably about a year and a half into their journey. So it was about okay. 25 people. And what was frightening is I was the most experienced person in the room. Wow. With my four years, uh, four and a half years of experience. <laughs> I went in um, and my role was to go in and really drive client servicing forward and um, commercial development and broadly the commercials of the business. But it was a really interesting time because we just got a strategic backer, um, really good, uh, really good investors. Um, and they were fueling a lot of the ambitions for international expansion. So it was, it, it was kind of a, a moment and a catalyst. And I suppose my job was to make sense of the chaos and 
enjoy it and, and, and try and just build on what was a phenomenal reputation and what I would consider a special place. Mm. What, what made it special? Um, I think with anything special, it always stems from people. Um, I think what Social Chain had, a, I'd describe it as this delusional ambition. And I say delusional because it was a very young business. You know, I, I joined the business maybe when I was, I think, 26 or 27. And one of the older heads, in, the oldest head in the second oldest head in the room, apart from the CFO, you don't want really young CFOs. True, <laughs> <yeah>. Allegedly. <laughs> um, but I was one of the more mature heads in the business. And um, yeah, uh, and as part of that, I think there's something about youth and optimism and not knowing better sometimes that can fuel you. I talk a lot about the curse of knowledge. Mm. I think you have so many advantages if you don't know too much. Um, because we all self-impose barriers and we put those walls in front of ourselves. So I think ambition was the first thing. There was very much an entrepreneurial flair. Um, and there was this idea that you, there was this idea that we would reverse engineer from first principles. So in marketing, the marketing industry was really established, but at social chain, everything was, well, what does, how do we create something really creative and unparalleled and exciting and reverse engineer that. And it might mean doing things very different to everybody else. And again, it's that combination of naivety, not knowing better, not knowing too much, and then just really appreciating creativity. Um, and it meant that the work was really good. And I always considered social chain, particularly in the early days with our clients, um, we were a high risk, high risk, high reward partner. You know, we would mess things up. We wouldn't be a safe pair of hands on a, a campaign with a big budget. But what we could produce is magic that other people couldn't because of kind of these internal philosophies and values. Um, and it was a real talent hub. When you see um, a lot of the people that have subsequently left the business and gone on their own entrepreneurial journeys and, and started, um, some people, it's funny, some people have called it like the... The, the poor man's PayPal mafia. You know, <laughs> I call it the poor man's because everyone's gone on. Obviously, that would be wildly arrogant to say anything in comparison, but there has been some really successful entrepreneur stories off the back of the platform that was Social Chain. Um, so yeah, great business. And is that because you recruited really great people or is that because you developed really great people? Um, a combination of both, actually. I think what social i always consider some of the decision making on paper sent like madness and i'll give you one example um the first investment check uh, that, that Stephen took um they bought a slide and it was like seventy five thousand dollars to invest in this office that bearing in mind it's a team of about 10 and they buy like twelve thousand square foot of space in manchester so really seemingly irresponsible decisions mm. but what that did was it set a philosophical value of everything to come thereafter as it related to policy, you know, it seems really common now that you do things like un unlimited holidays or you kind of put high trust environments. But back then it wasn't that common to start to just, re you know, re-engineer some of the things we take as known truths. Mm -hmm. um, so did we get everything right? Absolutely not. But there was always this kind of motive that underpinned that we would do the right thing. And it genuinely was a people first business. So I think that was... Um, really a big driver of the success of people. I think we were very open-minded to what talent looked like today. Um, so the company would actively encourage people to do wild, you know, get our attention type applications. One person flew in an owl one time with a USB stick. Another person sent in a blip and an air balloon. Like all those people that did the wildest things to get everyone's attention, so much effort went into them. And we would publicly broadcast that through Steve's channels. He would like vlog it and talk about all these. So it encouraged it furthermore. We were just getting hundreds of young people applying for this company that had a slide on limited holidays. So we were getting the cream of the crop itching, banging at the door. It wasn't always practical because the vast majority of people that did those wild outlandish things probably weren't the most experienced and actually didn't end up getting the job a lot of the time, but mm -hmm. they got the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in the infancy, the company made so many bad hiring decisions. You can't go, I remember the summer that I joined, we went from whatever, 30 people to about 100 across two or three months. Two thirds of those people just weren't right, weren't good. Like it was chaos, right? Mm. But I think in retrospect, when we took the business international and, and I started to build out the US business, we had all this hindsight of a few things we did wrong. And we started to just build a little differently as we expanded the business. 
So, um, so with the benefit of hindsight, then for watchers, listeners, and us, actually, what what did you what did you do wrong, and what did you do differently when you opened up in the US? So, what did we do differently? Um, I think there was a few things. We went into we went into the US with that delusional ambition. Mm. We were quite naive. We thought, you know, in the UK by this point, the world's biggest brands were knocking at our door mm. because we were getting headlines. The kids that could make anything trend. The Huffington Post calling us a social media illuminati. Vice started talking about all these. And again, to that first point around just creating a quite a special workplace, the media attention that surrounded the company was quite phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And also following a lot of Steve's journey and his progression through entrepreneurship. Um, so there's a lot of tension on the, the company and that helped um, talent recruitment. What it did do is, though, it set the bar really high of what we could achieve. So when we went international, we were like, of course, the world's biggest brands are going to knock on our door. Mm. They didn't care. (coughs) Excuse my friends. They just didn't give a fuck. We entered a really competitive market and no one cared. So our first job was, okay. well, how do we build a better business over here? So first and foremost, it came down to our work. In my view, we had to do better work to garner the attention because we didn't have this just influx of inbounds driving our sales pipeline. Mm -hmm. We had to have strategic allies. We had to get partnerships with other companies. um, And we had to work incredibly hard to start to build those um, inroads. And what one of the successes we had is because we'd worked with a lot of big international brands, we could enter the US market with some credibility. Mm. It wasn't a, a zero anything. We could say we work with Amazon, Coca-Cola in yeah. Europe. Although it wasn't in the US market and we had a lot to learn about US culture and the differences, you know, you're talking about 50 different countries effectively under the guise of the US. Yeah. You know, a family in Atlanta is very different to a family in LA and so so there are a lot of cultural differences, a lot of heritage, history in us. Understanding culture is like integral to a great marketing business. Mm. So we had a lot to learn through that process. But what I would say is we put a lot more merit in great people. So we we took the same philosophies. We started to adapt for the US market. We put a strong management team in place. Um, We encouraged all the philosophies that drove the US success, like experiment, test, appreciate, um, like knowledge. We would just share so much it was it was a place where people learned and to your point earlier did we develop we didn't have really good like formal development programs Mm. but we had a culture where everyone was encouraged to just share interesting things as it related this happened on social media how can we use that um this happened in the world with this client how can we use that and we almost had this like impatience and this energy that was injected into the business and we carried that to the us and when we started to get some big wins we were Early on, punching above our weight, we were winning some big businesses that we probably shouldn't have won. We got to a point where we're, we're, we're winning the Uber global contract at one point for a you know a relatively small team, team of 15 people. Um, that was like some inroads through a connection, someone we'd worked with previously that respected our work. Um, and that gave us all the credibility we needed to then go win TikTok. And then mm. go win all these other brands. So it it just felt like a series of seemingly, you could call significant milestones, but it was just compounding over several years. And by the time um, I'd exited the business, um, the US was the larger, or certainly the most profitable part of the the marketing services for social change. So, you know, to give people some context of UK US dynamics. Our retained work, the work that we did, would probably about 5x a fee in the US for a comparable amount of work. Mm, So the scale, and at a global level, you have a strategic advantage. It was an important milestone to break the US for us because when you win a contract in the US, it often has global governance or global influence. It's not always the same in reverse when you win a UK or European um, segment or division of the business. And that's why you went to the US. It's kind of you saw that opportunity and thought we need to. Yeah, just ambition. And it was really good for the team. Like mm. it was one of the primary reasons that it made my decision a little easy. I'm joining this startup that's thinking about international expansion. Mm. And it was this like really exciting moment. It was a dream come true, you know, this opportunity to go work in New York and uh, learn some things and all that type of stuff. Hi, guys. I just want to jump in and talk about a specific area of automation which we often get involved in, which is the processing of supplier invoices. 
or accounts payable automation as it's also known. Most businesses have invoices that they get sent from their suppliers. Essentially what our solutions do is they read those invoices, they extract key information from them, like purchase order numbers, supplier codes or supplier names. We then use that information and match that up against digital records. So can we find a purchase order number? Can we find a good received note for that product? If we can, then we can match it up, we can reconcile it, and we can automatically post that into your finance system. What makes us different is that we configure our solutions to be specific to your organization. So we're not an out-the-box, plug it in and see what you get. We actually understand more about your processes, your organization, your supplier base, and we configure the solution to meet those requirements. Hopefully that's enough to pique your interest. If it is, get in touch, let's have a chat. So you said earlier, Oliver, <clears throat> around the fact that, you know, there was an awful lot of sharing within mm-hmm. the team. So you worked at Bauer, you know, go get a sales, you know, um, expert knocking it out of the park. And obviously the, the natural instinct for sales and someone who's obviously, you know, a high achiever is you're, you're very competitive mm-hmm. and it, it can be very, you know, sort of, um, you know, locked into to you. Mm-hmm. So how did you find it so you you know about the fact that the team you you wanted the team to be Mm -hmm. sharers because actually the greater good was that if we all work together and we all share Mm -hmm. we're going there how did you find the dynamic of changing from being Mm -hmm. solely focused on sales to actually we're a team and if we work together we're going places yeah i think there was a few things within that the the company and at times to its fault we were all very transparent with the goals it was like our ambition here is to take the company public and we have these possible routes that will allow us to do that. And if we get to that milestone, um, the intent is to have as many people sharing that success as possible. So there'd be kind of these like embedded incentives. And I say shared to a fault because, you know, as, as and one of the naiveties of growing a business, you start to lose control at certain times. You start to, you know, make naive decisions that changes your influence in a large organization, the bigger the organization gets. So, um, you know, I, I often think everything was always done with the purest of intentions, but on delivery wasn't always, we made mistakes, right, as we went through that process. From a sales standpoint of coming in a very sort of structured quarterly, I actually think it was advantageous bringing that mindset into a business that was a little more unstructured. So it was being very clear and open and transparent with everybody that, you know, being part of a high growth business presents opportunities. Opportun- you can fast track your career 10 years if we grow, but those opportunities are only presented if we drive the commercial success of the business. But in parallel to that, it always felt like shared success, like massively over invested and i say over invested but it was particularly at the early days was quite a hedonistic culture i I wouldn't say it's the right culture for today but it was quite hedonistic partying those types of things and all fueling that like the wolf of wall street of marketing (laughs) um at times it might have been and actually you reflect on certain moments and go um yeah, there's an unintended consequence when you have this like high celebration, intense sort of hedonistic culture that's driving everyone's commitment and everyone's having fun because there are people that feel excluded. And, uh, you know, we would get that feedback over time. So as the business matured, it evolved. But that was certainly the infancy. But structure and having a sales mindset did help the business, particularly when it was in its more chaotic stage. Um, so you were talking about, obviously, cha- chaotic from, from the the sort of cult, the, you know the cultural side of the company, um, but also a lot of the concepts that you were doing in marketing were quite over the top and radical. Mm-hmm. Is that is that right? Yeah. So, can you give me an example of something that you think was particularly ambitious or crazy that maybe you couldn't even get away with doing? Yeah, I I think there's a underlying principle in marketing. Um, if you want outlier results, you have to do outlier things. And the great thing about any like smaller company that the com- you know started on, when you don't have a big budget, you have to be more creative. Mm. You have to be more creative in your idea. <clears throat> you have to be more provocative. You have to be more polarizing. You have to be more creative about your distribution methods. Um, it's really interesting. I think of these dynamics, and I'll, I'll go back to the question, but I think about these dynamics today. We're a, a team now, a flight story of, of about 45 people. We've grown that quite quickly over the last uh, almost a year, about nine, 10 months. Um, But our marketing team is a person of one. We have a studio. We produce more content than, you know, 
companies with thousands of people, mm. thousands of people, because we appreciate what content will do for us. But we also are marketeers. So you have a quite an unusual dynamic in a startup where Stephen and I and, and our founders um, were thoroughbred marketeers who have been advising big brands on how they use social media for a long time. So we pay a disproportionate amount of our time thinking about how do we market ourselves. And far too many businesses, particularly service or B2B, don't spend enough resource and headspace in promoting themselves and marketing themselves in the right way. Um, and some of it comes from a lack of understanding, but others is, um, you know, uh, a lack of appreciation for what great marketing is. And I think in the modern age where we have so many choices and we're, you know, spend so much time digitally, great marketing today isn't like really high quality. It's authentic. It's high volume, it's the relevant messaging, formatted in the right way, and it's very much system-led. It's like good consistently over time versus those magical moments that you described. Mm. Going back to those magical moments, I'll tell you the first kind of big successful campaign that Social Chain had. Um, so Social Chain was built not as an agency or marketing business, it was a collection of social media pages. So this was at a time when um, social media uh, was relatively new to organizations and companies quite hadn't quite understood how they use it and leverage it. But you had these kids over here that were build it, building communities based on passions. And I say kids like with respect, but it was young people just building pages they cared about, like sport pages. So is, it, is this like humor. Facebook groups? Yeah, it? Facebook yeah. groups, uh, Twitter pages, yeah. communities. Like think of them as like faceless influence. Mm -hmm. So the company were building like groups around Harry Potter and groups around, just think of anything you're passionate about, dogs, mm -hmm. sport, anything, um, food. We were just building pages around this. And it was at a point where you could go from, in a week, we could gain a million followers on one of our pages just from creating content. It was like a type, it was a gold rush of real estate. Mm. At one point, Social Chain was accountable for um, reaching about a fifth of the world's population with something we produced. Wow. Uh, we had more collective like online real estate than Time Warner and Disney combined at one point when we hit our sort of critical mass of producing content. But going back to like a successful campaign, one of the first businesses we worked with was an app and it kind of put the business on the map. I think it was Steve's, first or second TV appearance. But um, it was an app called Tippy Tap. And uh, what we did is we took that brief as we had a, li a very li limited budget. And I say limited, it was okay, but it was, but we had a revenue share embedded. If we could get lots of people to download this app, we would get a revenue share. Mm. Um, and what we decided, we took this app and we basically decided from our communities that we owned and operated, we would tell the world not to download this app because it's addictive, but we would layer in a contextual relevance to that specific group of people or community. So if you were on a, like a, a Sunday league football community, we would say, you're gonna miss football with the boys, don't download this app. If this was a like student humor page, we would say, you know, you, you're not gonna do your homework, you're gonna get Ds, blah, blah, blah. It was all humor led. So we told the world not to do something, and you do this at scale, and we pioneered a technique called a thunderclap, which is you get everyone doing it at the same time, and what you typically find is across social media, people share interests. Yeah. So you would see this, what felt like flooding of news feeds. That in turn would create these viral storms that would make things trend. Mm -hmm. Made this app trend for multiple days on a row. And it became the number one app in the app store for like five days or something. And because we had a revenue share, we earned, as the business, earned more money than it ever would have doing a traditional marketing campaign, yeah. which gave the business a platform to then do those types of things. And we would always take these like tactical, like really think about the nuance of delivery. The work we would do was always like element part psychology. How do people behave online? There was always some, I would say quite intelligent underpinnings mm -hmm. to, to what we did, but seemingly the delivery might seem trivial to a big brand. You know, and we spent a long time educating. I would go into the boardroom of like Coca-Cola and I, it was weird because I had the authority to say everything you are doing is wrong. And the CMO of one of the world's most iconic businesses would go, yeah, you're probably right. And there isn't a world, you know, 20 years ago where a 26, 27 year old could walk into the CMO of Coco and say, you're doing everything wrong. But their message to us is we want to understand young people, help us do that. How do we communicate better with them? And these were the types of briefs that we started to evolve into, but it all started with like just thinking outside of the box and being more creative. Mm -hmm. I love that.
So, so Flight Story then, talk to me about that. What's what does that business do? What's that about? What's the proposition? Yeah, so Flight Story is a, a, a you know post social change. Steve and I sat around the table and said, um, "Do you want to do something new?" And we said yes. Um, and there was two factors that went into our decision making process. One was what are we good at. It's a good starting place for any business. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and where can we apply what we're good at to greater value? So where do we take the skills and things we do? But where can we maybe maximize that value? So that was a, a part of the thinking process and. When I say what we're good at, we just still down. We're pretty good at giving teams philosophies to be great at marketing. Mm. And we think we run nice environments and businesses that people want to be a part of. So that, that was part of it. Um, the second part then is where does opportunity exist? Social chain was a benefactor of social media becoming increasingly important in yeah. the world. Um, so we looked at the landscape, said what interests us? So what interests us is this new reiteration of the internet, Web3. What interested us was finance. You were coming off the back of record numbers of IPOs. You had the retail wave. So we decided we'd take our skills of doing, I suppose, just good marketing for today, a really effective marketing for today. We applied it to the finance industry to start when we launched the business. Um, and it was the intention was that we'd revolutionize investor relations. So our view was you've got this changing landscape where the traditional archetype of an investor has changed. Like I have six apps on my phone that allow me to invest. Mm -hmm. And then you ask why, what's enabled this? Well, the fact that um, FinTech and technology means that uh, has just lowered the barrier to, to investing for everybody. As a consequence of that, you can have loads more people through COVID having time. You have things like crypto bringing young people into investing. And I started to notice my behavior change where me and my group of friends, we would talk about investing like sport. We'd have these group dynamics where we'd, like <clears throat> investing would become part of our passions. So we looked at the data and the data suggested that there's monumental movements. And then there was this like cult moment that um, every C-suite on the planet was looking at. It was Reddit and GameStop. And if anyone, they've, they've made, they're making like Netflix documentaries about this now. But yeah. if you're not familiar with the moment, it basically speaks to a Redditor who was an actual ex-trader that called um, Roaring Kitty. And he took uh, particular interest in GameStop as a, as, as a business and thought, thought it was undervalued. And he did this really thoughtful technical analysis and no one listened. So he started to get a bit more provocative and say, it's not about people not listening, it's about these hedge funds are killing this company. It's actually fundamentally an okay business, but they're short, they're taking short positions and they're abusing this company and they're abusing their power. That rallied the internet. And then over time, all these new retail investors, many of them naive, impressionable, went, yeah. And it's like where internet culture and it kind of gets together with capital markets. And that stock over about a month when it went through its catalyst went from a 340 million market cap to 40 billion. It had about in a 60, month, sorry. In a month. To, in, in a month. So these are not, these are like unthinkable things. And as a consequence, the hedge fund was killed off. So this became like regulators are panicking. What does this mean? The SEC is getting involved. Nothing actually illegal has happened here. You've just got people who mm. are able to share and talk, not giving investment advice, but just sharing their takes, banding together to take on the system. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it was a bit of an anarchistic burn down the system. You had similar movements in crypto, people buying like meme coins. Mm. Uh, they call them shit coins, but people just getting behind like a cute coin for fun. And then you had all these like crazy dynamics where people are now seeing digital assets like NFTs as like these things that is going to be future artwork that's going to make me super rich. So you have all this weird stuff happening and we're thinking, oh, this is interesting. What do we do really well? We're really good at helping companies tell their story online. And if you can tell your story online in this dynamic, particularly in finance, that's a superpower. Yeah. So we launched the business in December. We'd worked, fortunately, we had enough of a reputation so some some thoughtful partners would trust this new business. We took on some big projects and we started to test our theories and it started to work. So we applied some of our marketing models that we did with big brands, applied them in a different sector in a different way that was considerably more regulated. So understanding those dynamics and we had great success. And then we thought, right, we need to expand this. So we took a look inwards and we thought, well, we don't just, there's a lot of industries that are changing. We want to be a marketing service group for companies and industries that are going through change. So we started to work with a lot of disruptive technology. And today we've built, a, I suppose, a four system structure where we have a strategy house in London. We have a content division 
Um, we have a media division that helps people distribute, and we've started to build some of our own attribution technology. So making sure we measure the work that we do, um, bringing together some of our, our knowledge and expertise um, on a platform. So that's how, we're, that's how we currently are. And we've took all these kind of like values and hindsight that we learned from our previous experiences and went, how do we do this better, faster, and bigger? Um, and in a more mature way. And, and I suppose my perspective going into this was we did pretty well out of like with no experience, no resources, um, you know, probably not as capable as we are today in many respects. Now we have resources, we have a bigger platform, mm -hmm. all of these things. We have even more ambition. So like... So, so you're still helping businesses connect with investors? Is that retail investors or so, institutional investors? Or? So that's a combination of both. We started in retail, but we're okay. expanding our team's capabilities um, as a combination of both. And the way I would describe our long-term vision is there are things that communication and marketing can do with any business. It can't improve your bottom line. It, it can never improve your bottom line. That's an inward uh, you know, decision as an operation. But what marketing can do is marketing can build your brand and reputation. And brand and reputation is what people think about you. What are their preconceptions? Mm -hmm. What are they saying about you when you're not in the room? That's your brand and reputation. And marketing can do that. What marketing can also do is help you grow. It can grow headline sales if you sell things. It can help you grow users. So the marketing as a, as a, a discipline can do those things. And as a consequence of having a great reputation and brand, growing at the right rate, you can ultimately increase your value, whether you're a private or public company. And in a public company sense, it's shareholder value. Mm. So we work on pulling out those equity stories, like what are the things we need to tell investors? So think of it as a bit of a pyramid where we help companies with their brand, we help them through growth, and then ultimately that's geared towards what management teams generally care about is their value. Hmm. So how do you <clears throat> how do you communicate? Because one of the with those investors, because you can get quite old and mm -hmm. you know, excuse the the expression, like fuddy duddy, I quite like my, you know, my our report and accounts and I, I yeah. like it in in hard copy. And obviously you're much more technologically advanced and you, you're all about communicating that information electronically in whatever meme. So how how did you overcome the fact that the the, the landscape of investors mm -hmm. is very broad? So yeah. I appreciate you're looking to take and assist companies in getting those maybe younger investors, but but you're not just picture holding that you're you're by the sound that you're also catering mm -hmm. for the the institutions that invest yep. pension funds that invest mm -hmm. how have you catered for that so I, I think the distinction sometimes we've made between these arbitrary lines of institutional and retail investors is actually kind of disingenuous because if you work in the city at a pension fund and you're deploying you know billions in capital you are also a retail investor mm -hmm. i guarantee you make investments in a personal capacity yep. And my fundamental belief there is you're influenced by some of the similar things. You may be more educated, you may have more access to capital, you may be in a different position, you may have more tools at your disposal, more data, but ultimately you have similar influences. You read similar news. And from a company perspective, um, often they're operating blind. You make intuition. In the, I suppose, investor relations remit, um, there are a couple of key voices, typically speaking. So one of them is usually a corporate broker an IR firm or a financial PR firm, they help. Um, and the banks and investors and management teams. But usually management teams take counsel. So they're not funded, they're saying the thing they wanna do, but generally you're having corporate brokers and regulators and banks tell you what you should say. Um, and there are some fundamentals that you have to adhere, adhere to from a compliance standpoint. But if I think about investors, the, the kind of wants and needs of investors are evolving universally. Like, the fact that investors are making ethical decisions now would have been a thing of craziness 20, 30 years ago. Guys, I'm back. I just want to jump in and talk about a specific area of automation that we get involved in, which is called RPA, also known as robotic process automation. Basically, what that does is it replicates human behavior. So we use software bots to replicate human behavior. So anywhere where you've got people or teams of people going onto different systems, copying, pasting data, going onto web applications or portals, downloading information, uploading information, any of that stuff tends to be rule-based. Go here, do this, do that. And instead of using your people to do that, actually you can use a bot to do that. So we can train, configure a bot to do exactly that process. It's a massive growth area, really exciting, exciting technology. 
Gartner talk about it as being the fastest growing enterprise technology in the market. Hopefully that's enough to pique your interest. If it is, get in touch. Let's have a chat. See if we can. Help. What's the film with <laughs> Jerry Maguire? Sure. Not Jerry Maguire. No, not Jerry Maguire. What's the Wall Street? Wall Street. The film. Yeah. Like the greed is good. Narrative. Yeah. Like that. That's like being capitalism and investing for the longest time. Now you have people that care about the companies. You now have these dynamics in capital markets as well, where you know there are value and fundamental stocks. Then you have like a vast majority of the market that's future facing. People are backing the vision. And if you're a future facing business that isn't revenue generative or is built around some great IP or some great technology or your future promises, everything you do is story. And like the distinction between everything you do as a company and what you should do as an investor from an investor relationship, that, that, that gap should be bridged. And no one is bridging that gap. You have these like, individual uh, turnkey solutions that haven't changed in 30 years and then you have everything else you should be doing and we try and within an organization connect those dots between everything you say publicly mm. and feeding some of your investor narrative and it doesn't have to be just about your your fundamentals and your financial report it can be building the profiles of your management team the link between like management teams and investor confidence is quite closely correlated right you can get quite far between your credibility and such so there are many dynamics to this but i do think to your point like the 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 classic sort of definitions of what an investor is i think those walls need to come down and we have to have open dialogues and then even just in retail investing I, having lived out in the US for some time, it's interesting to see the, the relationship people have over there with money versus here. With here, we don't consider ourselves investors if you have, an, if you have a pension. Um, we don't have stock tickers on every news show that we think they have. Because they don't have, the, I suppose, the social security blankets in the US, whether it's healthcare and you know pensions and such, um, what you do have is this like, uh, this like appreciation for what their credit rating is and investing and their 401k and you have almost this societal recognition that like finance this whole system that underpins society is really important and people pay attention and make investment hence why you see more people making I think um, retail in the US accounted for 20 I think 22 percent of all investing at its peak, more than mutual and hedge funds combined in terms of sort of volume. So retail is a big proponent, but it really is vast and varied. It's someone who works in the city, thorough technical in their analysis, through to young, impressionable person who's backing a, a shit coin because his mate did. Like, it is that broader spectrum. And I think sometimes that narrative about young, impressionable can be unhelpful because it almost, um, it almost diminishes the actual movement that is a, a very thoughtful, educated yeah. uh, movement, I would say, by large. When earlier, you said about um, social chain in terms of re recruiting talent. You had slides, you had unlimited holders, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But then you also said everyone's got that nowadays, and we need a slide off the back of this. We don't well, need a slide. Uh, but can I just interrupt you? Because go on. did anyone actually use this slide? Absolutely. Inclu yeah. Yourself included? Abs uh, well, once or twice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After the party. Um, not through the day, it's not the... <laughs> what was what was the, the utility like? Did it did it lead from like one office to another or was it just like... It, boom, led to a, a it went from a like snug type meeting room down to a ball pit that was like by a fire lodge type. <laughs> nice. it, was, it was really, it was really, it was like the most random place. Yeah, but, but every, every marketing agency in the UK has now got a ball pit, surely. So uh, not how? quite as I, I still think we flex that that space is still pretty spectacular compared to most. But okay. I, I know the point. Yeah. So, so what are you doing as Flight Story? I guess to to recruit and retain <clears throat> top talent. Yeah, I think um, Flight Story is a different business. Um, we we uh, a more mature business. We have different requirements than probably Social Chain had. Mm. Um, what we do have an appreciation for. We went against convention when the world goes remote. We're an office first business. Um, and that was a conscious, and I say office first, because um, we don't believe we'll achieve our ambitions. We're a business that relies on synchronicity. We're a business that relies on like people really being invested in caring. And I don't believe you can recreate that virtually. I, I think virtual work is more transactional. It's not to say it's wrong. Everyone has different perspectives and life stages, but for what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to take over the world and 
achieve amazing things. And I fundamentally don't believe we could do that unless we put the office and the community front and center of what we do. I don't want to do forced fun quiz nights on a Thursday on a Zoom. I don't want to like, <laughs> I've done all that through COVID. Like that for me is not. And you know what? We're not the right place for certain types of people um, and, and at different life stages. But if you're aligned with what we're doing, you've got a thirst for kind of learning, you're very ambitious. We can be a place that I believe we can give all the same things that I was a benefactor of at Social Chain to the people within our teams. But what we've been conscious to do is we brought together professionals from very different backgrounds, which again, has a it, it shapes the business differently. So our management team came in, a lot of them were finance professionals, a lot of them were from large consultancy businesses that are very good at connecting the dots, mm. a lot of marketeers, a lot of creatives, and. Having gone through that process and seen these kind of shared learnings from different sectors and different experiences and different backgrounds, like this is the best team I've ever worked with, hands down. It's the best team I've ever worked with because everybody is anchored to these very clear values, this really obvious transparent ambition that we set out, this momentum that we're getting because we're doing great work and this obsession with like doing the best work. Um, And then also just sharing learning. And then underpinning all that is like a load of nice people that I like spending time with. Mm. I think that's like, you've got to have that as a fabric. And so is that, do you think that's a deal breaker for any company or is that just the way you want to sort of run this? No, this is how I think we decided we wanted to. Like before we start this, I said like, you have to match your ambition. A company's actions have to match their ambition. Mm. And that means... Like our ambition means a certain level of sacrifice and compromise and being very clear. I think what's happened in the last few years is management teams of companies have got very scared of the internet and feedback and scared of like giving opinions. And because we live in this world that's very binary, you're on one side or the other, Mm. um, like real honest, open discord doesn't happen. And if it does, people are scared by it. And maybe they should be. But I went into this knowing very well that as a team, we'll build very transparently. I st- I had a meeting with the team this week and said, um, you know, there's something we thought to be true. Um, I've probably not communicated it well. Give me a break. Um, I will fuck up. I'm not perfect. Um, none of us are, um, but we will be better. And thank you for sharing with me. And I hope this is a place that you can all share your perspectives that may be wildly different to mine. So it's like, it is a top down sort of philosophy that leads to i think those like environments that can be enriching and can be mature yeah that cancel culture is no joke is it so i noticed that when you a lot of the content you've been posting yeah um and we sort of touched on this off camera with what we're kind of doing with the podcast is you're not really talking about flight story a lot no and not really you're not really pointing to what you guys do or anything like that you kind of from it you appear to just be Sort of offering insight, mm-hmm. perspective, value. Can you sort of sp- can you sort of speak to why that is and the value of that, and why other people mm-hmm. should be doing that sort of thing as well? Yeah, absolutely. I can't overstate the link between um, you know the team, the management team, everybody's um, I suppose reputation and the company they work for. Those two things are interlinked. If you have a team that put out great ideas into the world consistently all the time, that raises the equity of the company. One of the first things people say when I sort of meet new potential clients and people we work with is, oh, I've seen your LinkedIn. You guys are like flooding LinkedIn. Perception is half of the battle, right? Yeah. So when we as a team, and we were very clear, we want to set the systems. There are a few arenas in marketing where you can, there's a few areas where you can have an organic reach meaning you can do things and reach lots of people without spending media dollars. And for me, LinkedIn and TikTok are those two arenas that you can do this. So um, LinkedIn is our battleground. And in a marketing function, we were really disciplined. We can do lots of things. We can build a podcast. We can do newsletters. We can do a million things. We stay very disciplined to our game is LinkedIn. We're a B2B business and we want to continue to flood news feeds. So step one for us, was build a system that um, meant it was convenient. So how do I build a system in my life that works for me? I'm not a very good writer, but uh, I can talk for England. So, okay, let's do video. Let's Mm. just put a camera in front of me and we'll talk. So that was like the format for me to deliver, Mm. to deliver my message. Other people in the team um, uh, are like uh, uh, more articulate with their words and, and appreciate writing and great writers. So that's their forum to deliver content. So it's, It's kind of encouraging people internally 
as a business empowering everyone and encouraging everyone to create content, that's a starting place. Then develop the systems that mean you can do it efficiently. Once you have that, you ultimately end up being consistent. We say our job is not to be perfect, just consistent. So we like put these arbitrary, we're gonna just, I post every, I create content every single day, but I do it in an efficient way because I, my first foundation is consistency. The compounding interest in a year's time of me just saying something every single day, mm. whether it's right, wrong, indifferent, will be a massive net positive. Yeah, yeah. Once you have that, the next layer is how do I scale volume so you get more efficient? How do I do more of the same? And I can't overstate, like, if you are competing with me as a business and I put 20 times more pieces of content than you out and I can figure out a way to do that efficiently, cost effectively, I will win you every time. I will win the attention battles every time. I will win the perception battles every single time. So that's kind of stage two. And then stage three is understanding the craft and art and science and using data to guide your decision making. What's What formats need to work? How do we incrementally 1% improve this video? Let's test some new formats. Let's see if that's going to perform better. And we went day one. Um, we did a, at one point, a good example, a month ago, we did a full batch of content, like 25 pieces of content that were going to go out on my channels. We didn't switch the mic on. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, we didn't switch yeah. the mic on. Air. Every sound engineer is going to the world. <laughs> oh, you've got this fancy setup, but your, your sound's terrible. Yeah. I'm like, I don't care. It goes out. Well, I'm not recording it again. That's a, a time wasted. And I don't care. The ideas went out. Did they perform as well? No, they didn't add to perform as well. So I now have more conviction in making sure the audio is right. Mm -hmm. So again, you just make sure you analyze, you learn, you go through the process, but follow systems. Consistency, number one. Efficiency and scale, volume, number two. Mm -hmm. Then refine it. Refine your messaging. Use intelligence, feedback, data to guide everything you do thereafter. And if you follow that system, I guarantee you'll have so many advantages as a company. Do you find brands struggle with that? Because I know, I know brands can be protective of oh, yeah. their reputation and that, the risk of putting anything out there that would in some way damage that brand equity. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's the biggest barrier. Um, companies trying to control employees. It's that I think uh, I spoke to our marketing team yesterday about, you know, uh, things that are like accepted today that I think are going to be uh, like seen as obscene in 10 years. One of them to me is this idea that companies will have any say on what you post personally. You know, they say, yeah. um, uh, not my professional views, but my personal. Yeah. I think it's going to be such an overreach in 10 years yeah. for companies to have any say in what you say in your personal life. Does it mean human nature will judge you, will stop judging you? Absolutely not. I'm going to judge people for what they say. Of course, yeah. I'm human. But I think as companies and organizations, that's going to be an overreach. That's the biggest barrier. What you have with organizations is legacy and history and systems and processes. And some of them don't lend themselves to helping you be effective today. And like one of our first jobs at Flight Story with an organization is we go in, we assess the company and we try and understand what internal levers they have. It's usually an internal job. Before we do anything, our job is to spend and get perspectives from their management team in different departments and just spend time with them, not only learning about their business, but knowing what they do well, what they need to do more of. How do we slowly start to educate from within about the right things to do? How do we help them get over their ego? How do we help them get over this like want to be perfect? These are things you have to remove. And when you get past that point and you start to see positive results, there's nothing that's more reaffirming than results. Mm. So I started creating content four months ago. Stephen's always been the content guy. Absolute, the most eloquent, um, incredible thought leader. So he's been the content person. I used to do a lot of speaking on stage, but speaking on a mic and doing content, slightly different art. Um, so I started, I took the responsibility, right? I need to scale this and do more myself. So we went through that same system our, ourselves. We started on Zoom calls. It was like Zoom content, mm -hmm. ideas, overly curated. We then incrementally changed that to a studio setup. Then, um, you know, we started to improve the formats and tests and this evolved over time. What I've seen in the space of four months is actually just given me way more conviction that it's the right thing to do. Anecdotally, everyone says to me, love your LinkedIn content, that's the first thing I see. So they have a perception. They know my ideas on work, uh, remote work. They know my ideas on marketing. Um, I deliver, deliberately provoke at times um, because, you know, the... I, I think that's interesting for debate. It drives things forward. I don't always agree with all my, like I get things wrong and actually I'm open-minded to when someone says something quite insightful back to me, I go, okay, maybe I'm a bit misguided, blind spot. I'm happy to have those 
uh, things in place. But once we got the system, I think my growth story was about 12,000 followers in four months. My average video gets about 100,000 views now, and we put post two a day. So we've got to a point now where just, and this has cost us nothing but time, energy, and you can say there's a cost to content. Of mm. course there is. But the rewards, the increase in our inbounds, the increase in um, the, the ability, I can now as a consequence of people having a perception and maybe respecting some ideas, liking some and disagreeing with others, um, I can reach out to a CMO of a, a reputable brand and say, I want, I'd love to speak to you for these reasons. Mm -hmm. And four times out of five, they're more likely to do it as a consequence of at least having some perception of what they think of me. And that's all been delivered just through content. How, how do you manage the change with a, with a CMO that is not used to this world? How do you... How do you take them on the journey of change. Yeah, I, I think the universal truth, what you have with anyone, everyone always wants to do the best work. Everyone always wants to do the right thing, but they have certain either prejudices or certain internal corporate barriers that stop them doing that. So I've never met a CMO that doesn't want to like win, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like there isn't, there isn't a, a person that doesn't want to do better work. They may have context that I don't, that inhibits them, so we try and just be a practical voice. How can we help them build the business cases? And it might start small. You know, I remember five years ago telling brands, be on TikTok. They're like, yeah, but all our competitors aren't on TikTok. No one else is doing it. I'm like, be on TikTok. Why? Um, unparalleled reach. You can, TikTok is a interest-based platform. That means you don't have to own an audience, but millions of people can see you. Brands are not congested in this space. Mm. And people always want to have the answer. Everyone wants these great results, but they, they want the predetermined rule book. Mm. And unfortunately, if you want the great results, you can't follow the rule book. So you have to take some risk. And it all starts internally with a philosophy. So our job often is helping the management teams build the business cases, do some small testing, reaffirm results because you have to get results. And that then, then fuels more business interest usually. Mm. You um, you said oh, oh no, you didn't say um, but um, obviously flight stories you know in its infancy you know mm -hmm. growing exponentially by the looks of it recently you bought Nuevo I don't know if I pronounced that right. yeah we made an investment in yeah Nuevo. yeah um, but and so my role on this pod is I ask stupid questions on what the a old great job <laughs> well yeah yeah. <laughs> A stupid question. Fun, alert. Funny, did he? I think you said. I think you said that earlier. <laughs> did I? Yeah. Well, I, I kind of wanted to you move wouldn't... on from that, but thanks. Um, uh, and I, I noticed in there, there was a, a press release back in September that um, there's a term greenwashing. Yep. Help me. Well, greenwashing. <laughs> Great question, right? Um, I did say stupid question. Alert. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like greenwashing the... is companies doing disingenuous things for their own gain. So uh, companies will um, maybe lie about their green credentials or their efforts oh, in okay. sustainability and making more ethical decisions. Mm. The problem with greenwashing is, and I, this is where I'm tormented, I go, do companies make disingenuous decisions to serve their bottom line? Of course. Like, what game are we playing here? Mm. That, that absolutely happens. But then I go, a part of me goes, well, if everyone makes a slightly more improved version, even if it's disingenuous, maybe the outcome will be better. And I hate the extreme activism that just judges everybody. If you're not perfect, you can't be part of our thing. I hate that mentality. For me, as a company, if you make slightly better, how do you expect a fast fashion brand to go from polluter, sinner, ethical, you know, all these questions to perfect overnight? They are not. What are they gonna sack their 5,000 people and mm. start to get, what, what do you want from them? So I think we have to have more balanced debate, nuanced debate around making better choices. And if a company decides to make a, a better choice, even if it's disingenuous, maybe be, give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe not be so judgmental because none of us are perfect. I think this, this pursuit of being virtuous, um, we see it time and time again, people who claim to be perfect, we find out they're not because mm. what? We're all flawed. So yeah. I, I think the, the greenwashing thing, I'm, I'm always conflicted. I think it's not about like shaming people into better decisions. The way you bring people to make better decisions is you inspire them. You inspire them that they, they have a responsibility. And you don't do that by judging people or throwing, like calling them out when they do something better. 
champion it and say you can do more. So is that what is that the function of this company that greenwashing? So uh, Nuevo, um, a bit, what they've done is um, a phenomenal founder Jack. He's ex-military, worked special forces, real creative guy. Sold his last business to Berkshire Hathaway, and he came out of that process going, he wants to have a purpose-driven business, and he cares a lot about the environment and sustainability. He looked at the advertising industry, and the advertising industry is one of the most virtuous. It's one that, you know, on one hand says we do all these things, we we don't no longer have plastic, we don't have straws in our office, but we work with BP. Like that's the type <laughs> of hypocrisy that exists in advertising. Um, so so underlying that, like what I would say they do is they looked at production companies and because of his military background and the team he had, he can do these really complex productions that are like send 60 people into the Himalayas and film stuff. Like that's really hard to do logistically. And he knew through smart planning and using technology that like you could um, reduce the carbon footprint of those productions. They, they actually, when you're flying in people all over the world across multiple days, it has a, a big carbon uh, there's, a, there's a big carbon footprint to those endeavors. What he said, well, maybe if we get smarter about planning, put a bit more thought. Maybe if we put some measurement frameworks in place, we could reduce. So they started doing more ethical productions. Then they realized, well, we can do better. So they then started to introduce carbon offsetting initiatives. So every production that they do is carbon neutral or carbon positive. And actually, if you have a sustainability value or commitment or an ESG uh, commitment as part of your corporate agenda, they'll produce you a, uh, an impact report that does that. So if we think about our suite of tools and companies that we want to be a part of and to invest in and build, um, that's a perfect alignment. Companies need to start making better decisions to protect our planet. They're a great creative team that do just that. And they use technology. It's a very future facing service. So in our service stack as a company, it fits in perfectly. So we knew we had to, to make a commitment to them. Love it. Love it. So I admit. Let, I want to just take you forward a bit, Oliver. So um, if you think of your industry in terms of what you do in terms of marketing, mm -hmm. what, what is that going to look like in 10 years time? What is marketing going to look like in 10 years time? It's really interesting. Uh, I love Notre Dame exercises because I can't be wrong. <laughs> or I can't be wrong in 10 years, We're right? going to dig this out in 10 years. <laughs> I love just speaking to the future because like, prove me wrong. Go on. <laughs> um, so I, I think what you're seeing is a shift. If I look at the macro shift, so um, marketing evolved when the internet came along and things started to become digitized. So we went from things in the real world to things being put on the internet and email, um, websites started to evolve, commerce started to evolve as a consequence of that. So that's like the interesting space. Then social media comes along and we start to behave differently and we're more interconnected. And this creates new opportunities for businesses and for marketeers. And what that's done is it's created a system where, you know, um, I think brands and businesses need to have a deep nuanced understanding of online platforms to be effective. I think they need to remove all those barriers we talked about, ego, and just work and reverse engineer the right thing to do, do it consistently over time. And that's like a good marketing strategy. And then I think the transition is like all these new technologies that are evolving, the next reiteration of the internet, what it means for is there's going to be new commercial models. Um, creators or people that have an audience, content creators, now are going to stop working with brands and they're going to start like creating their own products and services. They already have the thing that's valuable, influence and an audience. Mm. They're now better placed. I heard a quote recently that suggested um, it's never been easier in history to turn content an influence and an audience into capital. And what that means is you've never been able to commercialize an audience like you can today, an individual can. So I think we're seeing a shift in like uh, the power plays and how brands will interact with like individuals and creative and media. And then if I go one step further and talk macro business 10 years in the future, I'm obsessed with machine learning. I was like artificial intelligence. I went, it's going to take forever to come after the creative industry. I used a tool called Dalle 2, which is basically you input yeah. um, like a, a design system. So I, I type, um, I'd like to put this picture, I'd like to make his head bigger, I'd like to put it in an abstract scene and create a logo. And like, it will do something that is phenomenal. And like, as part of a design aid in the design process, I went, oh, designers are fucked. I was like, I'm so <laughs> off. You're, you're finished, all of you. Like, machines are going to do this and they do it better than most of you. So, but then I realized like, AI is only as good as the inputs. Mm. 
So I go, well, you need a creative vision. That, that vision I just articulated there was terrible, right? So you need conceptual creative to be able to deliver the outputs. Mm. But this starts to get interesting because copy, optimizing copy to say the language in a way that's most effective, that's going to become standard. Websites will get to the point when we transition to owning our own data, meaning like everything that is personal about me is gated. I have that through my own digital identity. It means my future website experiences can be personalized to me. Your reality of the world will be different to mine. The things I see will be different to yours. The colors I see, the things that influence me will be different. So that's like marketing, that changes everything. So I think we're at this inflection point where technology for a while and to me is a, has been a bit of a hindrance. We use technology for pointless reasons, particularly in COVID. The fact I see a QR code anywhere in the most pointless <laughs> places, like go into a mall, our opening time, scan a QR code, yeah. put the times on, <laughs> put the times on the wall. Like, that's why I don't tell me to scan a code to then go, like the use of technology has been overstated, but artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think it's gonna change everything. And we're only just getting to that point. So I'm fascinated by that. I'd rather work with these macro trends instead of against them. So I'm just obsessed with trying to understand how this can affect business. And I think that'll be a new frontier of marketing. Love it, mate. It, you, music to your ears, I assume, with Absolutely. the uh, artificial intelligence stuff. I just wanted to touch on what you said, the previous point about um, the the power of influence yep. and, the, and, and the sort of what the, the strength that influencers have. And even we're seeing it... Um, was it was it Molly May, or right. that became like the head of the the creative director of Pretty Little Thing? Yeah, yeah which is obviously an attempt to cash in on her influence and her audience. We've seen it recently with Kim Kim Kardashian became the mm-hmm. the, the the chief taste officer or something <laughs> for Beyond oh, for Beyond, Beyond Meat. Meat. Mm-hmm. Um, who had a bit of, did add a bit of you know a bit of scandal and mm-hmm. they brought her in. Yeah, which obviously you know. For all intents and purposes, is a is a is a nonsense role. You could you could make an argument of that, right? But actually, sounds like a pretty good role. <laughs> well, it does, yeah. But for, for, for beyond me, it's, again, it's a it's a, she's obviously getting paid a lot of money, doesn't really have to do anything, and they get access to her mm-hmm. hundreds of millions of. So it, it's kind of interesting that you brought that up, and I just wonder when you say that's going to become become more valuable in the future. What can businesses do, like other than that? to cash in on that because obviously it's going to become more difficult over time. So to get Kim Kardashian today to endorse you and even take a multi-million dollar check, she needs skin in the game. Mm. So you have to go into partnership. Yeah. Why else? She'll sell her own products. She'll sell skin. She'll sell her own makeup. Like, why? Yeah. Why would she resource any resource, anything in something that isn't her own unless you put skin in the game? So this is again about the shift in power. Mm. Um, celebrity endorsements have existed as long as, you know, you can think marketing as a discipline, PR. Uh, like yeah. people endorse, celebrity endorsement is this. What you have now is though just a, a much more uh, skeptical audience. People want authenticity. People want partnerships that make sense. That one was interesting, the Beyond Meat one, because it was done in quite a satire way. So they're like, even, they actually counteract. If you looked at the launch of that, they made mockery that Kim was actually the chief taste officer. So they did it in a satirical way, which again leans into this idea, you know, and people did applaud it. I think the stock price rose circa, I think it was around 8% on that announcement alone at the time. Obviously, stock prices fluctuate mm. and change over time, the yeah. macro view. <clears throat> but do I think it's a positive move? having the backing of people with like real influence. And whether you agree or not with Kim Kardashian or you like her or you don't, she has a phenomenal influence over a lot of people yeah. and has a big role in the world. Um, you can ask moral, ethical, you know, societal questions of whether that should be, that's correct or not. But that's, you know, that's a bigger debate. That's the, yeah, that's where the world is. And, and can, I know you get ready. I just want to, I just want to get some final little yeah, go for it, squeeze go from the, from the lemon. Um, how, all right, that's that's fine for these huge companies. Mm-hmm. But what about smaller SMEs, yep. you know, B two B companies, etc.? Yeah. How, how can they utilize this? Inf- in your opinion, yeah, yeah. how can they infl- uh, utilize this influencer? Uh, I I think you lean into your advantages. If you're a smaller business, what advantage do you have over a big organization? You're probably not encumbered by risk in the same way as a like. Mm. If Coca Cola make a mistake, it can be drastic. Mm. If, you know, Bingley Chippy makes a mistake, (laughs) 
not drastic. <laughs> Right, so there's, there's a spectrum of these things. So I think first and foremost, lean into your advantages. Agile, small. Um, I, I think that can be a huge advantage in marketing today. Bigger, better, more budget doesn't always win. What it does mean, though, as a small business, you have to be more thoughtful. We are a small business. We try not to spend money. We try to make every dollar count that we spend. Every moment of time, we want it to give us the maximum output. So I would just say follow our principles create systems that allow you to put your value add into the world, your team's value add, um, do that consistently and focus in on, don't try and do too many things, focus on one channel, two channels, just do it as well as you can mm. and try and win in that space. Brilliant, well thank you for brilliant. helping us create some really valuable content today, really appreciate it. Oh, thanks no, for brilliant. Thank you very much. And, and, and so good to, I feel like you've reiterated pretty much everything I've ever said. You are, Yeah, you have. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's Almost so like you've scripted him before this. This is We're not going to the end of that whole journey <laughs> I, home. I, I yeah, will, you will see my invoice in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you'll never see me again. <laughs> <laughs> Spot on. Thanks, Thanks, no, thank you, Jen. Thanks,